Welcome, everybody. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the CEO of the SOAR Financial Group. Welcome to the first Mining Gold webinar today. Um, this is primarily geared at the European audience, so that's why the early start at 7 a.m. Pacific here. And uh, we, we have a few uh, listeners and viewers from all over the world, so we're going to do this primarily in English. But uh, with me is Talik Data. You can see him on the screen as well. And myself, we both speak fluent German. So if you have any questions, please make sure to put those either in the chat box or in the questions. You can ask them in German. So feel free to do that. We, we're happy to translate them for you. I told Dan to speak very slowly or just slower than usual so we can talk about all the, uh, the to important topics and nothing gets missed. So that's really important for us. Um, we're going to wait a couple more minutes for people to dial in. Um, some have to still download the GoToMeeting app. Uh, we prefer using GoToMeeting over Zoom because I think it's better picture quality and more stable. So um, it's just going to take another second and then we'll get started. All right, let's might, might as well get this started. We give, give people a chance to dial in. I think we've got a good audience here. We're going to get started. Um, as I said before, my name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the CEO of the SOAR Financial Group. Uh, I'm based here in Vancouver. Tarek, who is my director of roadshows and content, is based in Frankfurt. He's right on the screen next to me. And uh, as, as, you know, as you see him already, I'm, I'm pleased to be joined by Dan Wilton and Spiro Kakos of uh, First Mining Gold. Um, before we get started, I just want to give you a quick update on what's going on in the market, actually. Um, and what we're seeing here in Vancouver being based in Canada is a bit different maybe than in Germany. And uh, one, one thing I'm quite excited about personally is that schools are opening again. Seems like Vancouver and BC hasn't been hit as hard uh, in the current pandemic. So um, business is returning to usual. We've been back to the offices uh, to a degree. I've been to the office again first time on Monday. So there is a bit of return to normal. And uh, one, one thing, and Dan will talk about as well, like mining has been deemed an essential business in most provinces and territories. So there hasn't been a big impact. Most of it has been voluntary um, when, when there were shutdowns. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a second as well. Dan is gonna be talking about uh, Ontario primarily. Um, but if you have any questions in that regard, please feel free to use that. Um, a little more homework before we get started as well. Uh, you can see uh, the, the go to meeting dashboard on the right hand side, we got a chat function but also a questions functions at the end we're going to open the questions form um we're going to open it up so please make sure to put in your questions you can do that during the webinar as well we'll get to those at the end uh, we're going to let dan present for about 20 25 minutes before i cut him off <laughs> and then uh, we'll, we'll get to some questions so the idea of the format is to be around 45 minutes in total just to make it interesting and uh, make it interactive for you as well so it's not just going to be dan presenting Tarek is going to be hosting most of it and uh as I said before, no, just uh, I think I'm just going to let Dan present now. And uh, Tarek wanted to say a couple words as well before we start. So uh, I'm going to mute myself and unmute Tarek, and uh, we're just going to go get started. Okay, thank you, Kai. Um, yes, um, welcome to our presentation from First Mining Gold. Um, I think I'm here in Frankfurt, so the situation here is maybe comparable to Vancouver. Uh, Frankfurt is the city in Germany with the lowest rate of um, coronavirus. So we have a good situation here. My son is at school today. He will have one day for the next six weeks, every week, one day school. And the rest is homeschooling. Bad for my wife, but that's life. And <laughs> so the situation is very well here. And um, I hope um, the, the important thing is that everybody is healthy and stays safe. So. And we'll do um we'll just switch to German 
Ja, willkommen nochmal an unsere deutschsprachigen Teilnehmer. Wir haben für Smiling Gold hier sehr interessante Developer aus Kanada. Kai hatte eben schon gesagt, dass ähm, die Situation in Kanada sehr gut ist oder vergleichsweise gut. Kein Vergleich zu den USA, Brasilien, Russland, wo die Hotspots sind gerade. Ähm, hier in Frankfurt ist es genauso. Es war die beste Großstadt. Wir haben noch so einzelne Geschichten wie mit dieser Baptistengemeinde, wo dann gleich mal 100 Leute krank wurden. Also ähm, toi toi toi, bisher läuft es ganz gut in Deutschland, wir haben das hier gut im Griff und deswegen fängt auch langsam das Business wieder an. Ähm, zum Goldmarkt, wir haben heute gesehen, dass Gold ein bisschen wieder runtergegangen ist, nachdem die Aktienmärkte so stark waren. Ähm, grundsätzlich bin ich aber optimistisch, wenn ich ähm, andere Analysten mal zitieren darf, Markus Busler, den ich sehr schätze als Analyst ähm, im Goldbereich, der hat gesagt, wir könnten jetzt nochmal einen kleinen Test der Unterstützung sehen im 1700er Bereich und dann müsste es eigentlich im, spätestens im Juli wieder richtig hochgehen. Also der Angriff auf die 1800er Marke. Und das ist natürlich wichtig, weil wir jetzt im Markt sehen, dass die Produzenten stark gestiegen sind, wie Barrick, Newmont, Kinross, Agnico. Aber andererseits jetzt auch Developer-Unternehmen, auch fürs Mining, aber auch Explorer. Da fließt jetzt Geld hinein. Die, ähm, die Investoren haben Interesse und bei First Mining sieht man es ganz deutlich. Die Aktie war im Tief, im Ausverkaufstief im März, also diese technischen Verkäufe. Käufe im Goldmarkt hatten bei 12 Cent, 12,5 Intraday. Jetzt sind wir bei 26, glaube, glaube ich, gerade in Toronto. 26 Cent, das ist mehr als eine Verdopplung seit dem Tief. Und es ist einfach, ähm, man sieht, dass ja, die Investoren, dass die ETFs, die haben jetzt vier Monate Folge Rekord. Das ist gut, es, es sieht aus für den Markt, auch fürs Mining. Und ähm, dann möchte ich eigentlich übergeben an Dan. So, Dan, um, I just. Um, Yeah, introduce myself and talk about the market a little bit. Now it's your time to speak to our listeners. Please start. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thanks to Kai and the SOAR Financial Group for setting this up. Um, very much appreciated. We've been working together for a little while now and, uh, and they've been great partners to us. So very much appreciated. Um, I will aim to both speak slowly and progress through my material as Kai's heard me give this presentation a few times and hence the reason he said he's going to cut me off in 20 minutes. So um, I, I will move expeditiously through it. I'm going to make a few forward-looking statements um, that's in the presentation if you want to read that in more detail. So First Mining Gold really has one of the largest gold resource bases in Canada amongst gold developers. Um, 7.4 million ounces in the measured and indicated category and 3.8 million ounces in the inferred and focused really on two main assets, our Spring Pole Gold Project, um, which is an advanced asset that we're taking through pre-feasibility and through a permitting process and our Goldland asset where we're continuing to drill, uh, actually remobilizing drills out to the project uh, later this week, which is exciting. Um, But we think at Goldland, we are into a really a district scale uh, gold opportunity. The balance of our portfolio, another four projects, uh, totaling about four million ounces, um, all in Canada, all in great jurisdictions. Um, and we think this the balance of the portfolio provides some real optionality, not just exposure to gold, but also as we move these projects forward and find partners for them, um, opportunities to keep our company funded and the and the key projects funded to move forward. Um, as I said, all of our projects are in Canada and I think in times like this, we are really getting to understand the value of um, a jurisdiction. The Canada is a great place to be working and particularly in our area in Ontario, we'll talk a bit more about this, but um, a great place to be permitting and developing gold mines. Um, we are trading at a significant discount to our peers. We'll talk a bit more about that and we have the team in place to unlock the value. So, um, and just to give a bit of a sense, um, this is a little bit outdated. Our market cap today would be about 160 million Canadian. We finished the quarter uh, in March with cash on hand of a little bit more than $10 million. dollars. So well funded for the balance of the year. Um, we closed a financing in uh, early March, and we're very thankful to have done that, largely supported by our existing shareholders um, of about eight and a half million dollars. So that really gave us the funding we need to move the projects forward for the balance of the year. Uh, very good trading liquidity. We trade in excess of a million and a half shares on average, and it's been quite a bit higher than that in the last few days. 
uh, in Toronto and about half that again uh, in the US uh, in the OTC market. So our shareholder base is largely um, retail and high net worth shareholders. Um, a great supportive investor base that has been here really a lot of them since Keith Newmeyer set the company up in, in 2015. Um, and again, over the last year, we've raised $18 million, largely from our existing shareholders to help us move the projects forward. Um, management and directors, very uh, invested. I've bought more than a million dollars worth of shares myself in our financings and in the market over the last year, year and a half. Um, and uh, Keith Newmeyer is one of the largest shareholders of the company. Um, and yeah, small but growing institutional ownership, which we're, we're actively looking to grow, uh, covered by four analysts who would have price targets in the range of a dollar to a dollar fifty, so multiples higher than our share price right now. Um, I, I won't spend too much time on this, only to say that uh, you know, first mining really was put together in 2015 again by Keith Newmeyer, well-known uh, mining entrepreneur, particularly in uh, in German circles, uh, CEO and founder of First Majestic, and the company acquired eight projects or companies in a 12-month period when they put this together. And that's because the gold markets were in a very different position. Gold was $1,100 an ounce, and um, it was a very difficult time to attract capital. But the company basically put together all of the projects that they could get their hands on of quality. And uh, in 2016, when they acquired the last project, this portfolio had a market cap of 630 million Canadian. So since then, Four years down the track, we've, we're in a very different gold environment. And I think um, if you look at what's happened with gold since mid-2018, uh, I think this is the beginning of a much longer trend. And our share price is, uh, has been, in recent days, uh, it's bounced a little bit off from this, but at or near, you know, really all-time lows. So um, we think this just represents exceptional opportunity uh, for value in our company. We trade it today. It's probably about $10 an ounce uh, versus most comparable developers who would be in the range of 40. So um, again, I think as we can demonstrate a path forward for our projects and demonstrate the value of them, we'll talk about that with Springpool. I think there's lots of room to move this value up, lots of opportunity in this share price right now. Because we believe, based on this, these numbers are based on that developer average for our other projects and for our uh, net present value of our spring pole project, uh, as it was stated in our 2019 PEA, which was 840 million US, and this is that number converted to Canadian. We think we have more than a billion and a half dollars of asset value in this company, and we are trading at uh, about one tenth of that right now. So great opportunity for share price appreciation. Management team, again, Keith Newmeyer really needs no introduction. Uh, Well-known mining entrepreneur. I've been the CEO here for a little bit more than uh, a year. Well, almost a year and a half now since January of 2019. Um, had a great team in place that was moving the projects forward, but had to make a couple of very important changes when I came on. Um, including uh, adding Ken Enquist as our chief operating officer. And Ken has a great background of taking large scale projects through pre-feasibility and feasibility studies. Um, and ultimately having those projects acquired by much larger companies. Um, the last couple of projects Ken was involved with were the Timok project in Serbia in Nebsun, which ended up getting acquired by a Chinese group for a couple of billion dollars. And uh, after that, he led the feasibility study for Arizona Mining, which ended up getting acquired by South 32 for a couple of billion dollars. So Ken really brings project management and great technical expertise and rigor to this development uh, process that we have here. So our really our core asset portfolio is located, you can see here in this, in this area of Northwestern Ontario. This is a great place to be developing projects. Um, the infrastructure, uh, access to power, access to roads through a, a forestry network that extends up through the uh, through the area here is exceptional. Um, and we'll talk more about this spe specifically with respect to Springpole 
and Goldline. But this is a fantastic place to go to work. And, and to some of the comments earlier in terms of um, coronavirus impact has been really minimal in this area. Even if you extend it over to Winnipeg, uh, which is the major city about three hours from our, from our uh, Goldline project, um, Winnipeg's had very few cases. I don't think they have anyone in hospital right now with coronavirus. So this area has been largely unaffected, although, um, and again, Ontario, is, as Kai had said, has deemed mining uh, mineral exploration and development an essential service, which means that we could keep, we could have kept working and, and have been working really through the time since uh, March. Um, but demobilized our camps more due to spring breakup and uh, ground conditions than than really due to the virus. But um, it's uh, we're we're in the process of remobilizing to our camps now to start a summer program at Spring Pole and should get drills turning again at Gold Lund by this weekend, which we're very excited about. So we'll talk a little bit about our Spring Pole project, which is one of the largest undeveloped open pit gold projects in Canada. On a gold equivalent basis, it's in excess of 5 million ounces. Um, and uh, as we scoped it in our PEA, average annual production in excess of 400,000 ounces a year. This is a project that is big enough to be meaningful to the largest gold companies in the world. So we put out a preliminary economic assessment in 2019 that showed really robust economics. We'll talk about that in a minute. but after tax NPV of 841 million US dollars using a $1,300 gold price, which <laughs> seems like a long time ago, given the environment that we're in. Um, it's a great mining jurisdiction. And when you talk about permitting in Ontario, um, they have permitted four big open pit mines in the last four years. Um, you know, Hard Rock, uh, Cote, Magino, and Hammond Reef, um, all of them you know, some a little bit bigger, some the same size, some a little bit smaller than than uh, Spring Pole, but all big open pit projects around a lot of water. And we're in the same permitting process as those projects went through. So well-educated, supportive um, regulators who uh, are really focused on driving economic development in this area. Um, good relationships uh, with our local communities and our indigenous communities. We've been in active consultation for uh, for two and a half years now uh, and really building those important relationships. So uh, that's been very positive and we're taking the project through pre-feasibility this year uh, in partnership with Asenko, the global engineering firm, uh, and have a great team that's moving this forward. I've already done a number of the trade-off studies on the project and um, we're very excited about the direction that it's going in. And one of the things that uh, that doesn't get emphasized enough is with respect to Spring Pole, while you know, it may look remote when you, uh, when you can see it on a, uh, um, on a map, the reality is we're 40 kilometers from grid power and we're 30 kilometers from a class one forest road. So the access to infrastructure here, as the crow flies, we are 100 kilometers from Red Lake long well-established mining camp well known to a number of the investors uh, in the webinar i'm sure um, but no this really is a, a great place to be developing projects so this gives a bit of a sense of the of the topography of spring pole when you see it here um, the project is actually sitting uh, right about there if that pops up on the screen um, and at the bottom here, you can see this is a 115 kilovolt power line, and this is a class one forest road that goes up about that far. So um, really excellent infrastructure in the area. Um, part of the development plan for Spring Pole involves building a couple of coffer dams and dewatering a shallow bay of a lake. And this has been the biggest perception issue of this project and that people perceive it as either an insurmountable permitting challenge or an insurmountable technical challenge. And I think when the, when the project was first discovered or this deposit was first discovered, there were still a lot of unknowns. And over the last eight years, the company is, and our predecessors, honestly, have really come to understand uh, what a bunch of those unknowns are. So we've got eight years of baseline environmental work here that says that this is 
there are no um, species at risk. There's no unique fish habitat in the area. And the coffer dams, we've engineered to pre-feasibility level already, done geotechnical drilling under the footings and see there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to be built. Um, and the reality is these coffer dams are not significant structures to build in the context of you know, the overall construction of an $800 million um, project. So uh, with all that said, we think that as people start looking at the data, start looking at the work that we have done, and as we can demonstrate at a pre-feasibility level, the robustness of this project, um, we think uh, we're seeing people certainly change their minds on it. So I'll just uh, give you a quick, quick overview here. This is the site layout and important to know, this is you know, the small bay of Spring Pool Lake where the cofferdams get built. Uh, this represents, you know, 3% of the volume of the water of the lake and is sort of a remote and disconnected bay. So uh, that I think is important. Um, but as you, uh, as you can see here, the development plan involves a, a very tight footprint. And I think as we go through pre-feasibility, we're optimistic that we're gonna tighten this up even further. Um, and uh, I'll just give you a quick snapshot of the deposit itself underneath, because this really is what makes Spring Pole unique. Unlike a lot of other projects uh, of this size and scale, including, you know, if you look at Detour, you look at Malartic, they are not nearly as homogenous as Spring Pole. This deposit is essentially one big blob of mineralization, which I think, um, uh, give some really unique benefits when you go to actually develop it because it, you can be able to mine it effectively and efficiently. Um, and as there was always a, a, a perception at Spring Pole that um, there weren't many areas of higher grade, it is homogenous and very continuous. Um, but there are these red blocks that you can see here are blocks in our block model greater than one gram. So there is a significant amount of this deposit that is sitting at a grade greater than one gram. And you'll see that high grade does come up to surface. So part of the trade-off studies we've been doing in pre-feasibility have been around uh, understanding um, how we might be able to put in place a mine plan that allows us to get some uh, potentially higher grade earlier in the mine plan. But all of that translates into a really robust project. And I think that's what we demonstrated with our 2019 PEA, all in sustaining costs on this project in the low $600 and an ounce is equivalent, um, you know, mid 500s on a silver byproduct basis. There's a, there's a significant amount of silver in the, in the deposit. It's about 24 million ounces of recoverable silver. So ultimately we think that can be an important part in the project financing or, um, uh, in the financing of the project going forward. Low strip ratio, so about two to one strip ratio, which all of these things combine with that big homogenous ore body, low cost mining, it all combines to really robust economics. And I think when you look at, at the uh, sensitivity to the gold price, um, this just gives you a bit of a sense of the leverage that this project has you know, pre-tax NPVs of $1.75 billion at $1,500 gold, after tax $1.2 billion US. So that alone is, is, you know, 10 times our current market cap. So lots of leverage to the upside as we go into a, into a, a better gold environment. And why is this important? Ultimately, this is one of very few projects around the world capable of producing 400,000 ounces a year. So when we're coming into an environment where large companies don't have projects to build. Um, they are depleting their reserves every day with production. We think that um, we're in a very good position, not just with Spring Pole, but with the entire portfolio um, to have the projects in a position that uh, they are going to be at their highest value when the industry needs them the most. Um, and just size and context, uh, Spring Pole, if it were producing today would be the third largest gold mine in Canada. So, you know, very significant operation. Um, in terms of timeframes, we are uh, currently in the middle of the pre-feasibility process. I expect to have that completed uh, around the end of the year. We haven't had much slippage in our time, a couple of weeks maybe of time slippage um, due to the, the coronavirus crisis. 
Uh, where we will see time slippage is in our consultation with our Indigenous communities and in our permitting process. So, um, and that is largely because many of our communities are closed right now um, and rightly focused on the health of their own communities. Um, so traditionally, we would be uh, doing our consultation meetings in the communities. We can't do that now. So we and the ministry and the communities are all trying to figure out ways of how we can do that community engagement moving forward um, remotely. So that uh, is introducing some uncertainty, but we are aiming for having our environmental impact statement submitted in the middle of 2021. And then in Ontario, with these four other projects that have been permitted in front of us, that's been you know, a pretty reliable 18 to 24 month timeframe. So we're looking at the project permitted uh, with our federal environmental, federal and provincial environmental approvals in mid 2023, which, um, you know, the time is rapidly passing toward then. And I think in this gold environment, that is the perfect time when gold companies are really going to be focused on what their pipelines back and like in the back half of the year. So that's Springpole, very exciting project, you know, of major scale. Um, I'll talk very briefly about our gold loan project, um, which is uh, we're continuing to explore. It's about 800,000 ounces at almost two grams uh, indicated resource and 875,000 ounces at about a gram and a half. Uh, this is, an, this is in, a, in a pit constrained resource in a shallow open pit. This is one of the higher grade uh, open pit potential projects in Canada. Um, great regional district exploration potential, which we've just hit on the surface of. Um, but I think it's going, uh, it's, you know, we've demonstrated now with our program from last year that we think we are going to find a number of deposits in this 50 kilometer trend. And this is a great jurisdiction to be developing projects. In fact, our neighbor to the Southwest uh, Treasury Metals with the Goliath project got their federal environmental approvals um, in August of last year to build a, a mine and mill and conventional tailings dam. Um, so that just speaks to uh, the local community and their desire for to see economic development moving forward. So um, you cannot imagine better infrastructure here. These projects are just off the Trans-Canada Highway with power and natural gas and rail running down the side of them. So um, uh, this is uh, a very good place to be developing projects. We'll just touch very quickly on on uh, spring on uh, Goldland in terms of the regional exploration because I think this is important. The, the resource we have right now is just in the main what we call the Goldland main zone. Um, we stepped out in 2018 to explore a prospect 10 kilometers away along these these long regional trends and uh, tagged into the Miller prospect, which we then have now extended about 500 meters. Um, show a quick uh, a quick map of Miller, um, and with you know drilled it now to about 50 meter centers uh, down about 200 meters, and some of the drill results that we had at Miller I think were some of the best drill results in the mining sector in the last couple of years for open pit targets. We didn't seem to get a lot of attention on these, but 200 meters of 1.6 grams from surface, 40 meters of 4 grams in an open pit target. You know, I think we've we've done some internal work on Miller to understand what kind of size and scope we have. We don't think it's going to uh, it's going to bulk out like the Goldland main zone has, but I think it just demonstrates uh, that in this big land package, we are going to have a number of deposits. So we're very excited about uh, about that and have continued drilling on a number of the parallel zones and in between the zones uh, at Goldland. It is a series of kind of stacked granodiorite zones, um, and uh, finding some very interesting mineralization in between a couple of the zones where we weren't expecting, which obviously is very helpful when we're talking about open pit targets. But the uh, we're remobilizing drills this weekend to continue this uh, this drilling of parallel zones in the Goldland main zone, uh, and um, have a small program that will continue on for the balance of this year. But we will continue to find more mineralization and convert and upgrade mineralization at Goldland. So we're very excited about that. And just briefly on the balance of the portfolio, um, we have another four projects. We never have enough time to uh, to talk about them because you know I know Kai is going to cut me off pretty soon here. So 
but each of these projects are past producing or well understood projects. Many of them have been taken to feasibility or or were previously in production in great jurisdictions, all of them in Canada, million ounce-ish resources around all of them. And I think if, if you think about a path forward for a number of our projects, I think it's going to look like partnership deals that we've done with our Pickle Crow project. So we announced that in January of this year and found a, an Australian partner called Oteco Minerals, who uh, is a team that's had great success in another company called Bellevue Gold. Um, they were the Australian explorers of the year last year and developed a 2 million ounce very high grade resource by going into an old past producing mining camp um, that had been underexplored and applying really good geoscience kind of first principles gold exploration with modern techniques. We knew that Pickle Crow kind of needed that fresh approach um, and so when they approached us for this project uh, it took some time to get to know them, but we're very, very happy with the partnership that we have there. And in fact, you know, from when we initially announced this deal, uh, that they're earning into 80% of the company by spending four, uh, $10 million and giving us $4 million in cash payments, um, they now have a $50 million Australian market cap. So when you look through the value of what they have versus our and our and our uh, what we're going to receive out of the out of the partnership, our 20% interest, um, the share payments, the cash payments, and the royalty, and we think already this is showing in in excess of 20 million dollars of value for us, and that's before they've started drilling. So lots of good things to come there. But all that said, a very catalyst rich year in the in the back half of the year, finishing up the pre-feasibility study, which we think is a really important milestone, continuing to advance our permitting um, and targeting submission of our environmental income statement in uh, uh, as early as we can in 2021, uh, continue drill results from Goldland and, and I think more uh, news to come on uh, partnerships in the portfolio assets. So very busy year coming, but all of that sitting inside a company where you have gold trading at uh, at you know seventeen hundred dollars uh, an ounce, and and we and many other developers have yet to really see the value appreciation uh, that is to come. Um, but we're confident as we can demonstrate we're taking risk out of these projects um, that. Uh, you know, we're going to see that value come into our share price. So thanks very much. And with that, I'll turn it back over uh, to uh, to Tarek and Kai. And and uh, yeah, if you have any questions, you can find us uh, on our website, www.firstmininggold.com. Okay. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you for the presentation. And now we have the opportunity to to answer some questions. Um, you see it on the right side of your monitor. There you have the opportunity to write write on some some questions. Um, ja, vielen Dank, Dan. Nochmal auf Deutsch. Wir haben rechts die Möglichkeit, Fragen zu stellen. Wir haben auch schon zwei Fragen hier. Ähm, schreiben Sie einfach Ihre Frage hinein und ich frage den Dan, beziehungsweise der Kai, und ähm, dann können wir die hoffentlich beantworten. Genau, und ich fange jetzt einfach mal mit der ersten an. So, I'm starting with the first question, Dan. Um, the first question is just um, regarding Corona or COVID-19. So, w do you still have any restrictions on the projects? Um, yeah, just tell us something about that. Sure. Yeah. You know, in fact, um, <clears throat> we didn't ever really have restrictions on the project. Um, we, uh, I guess, it was uh, around the 20th of March in Ontario where they they uh, announced that all businesses were going to be shutting down. And very quickly, like the next day, they came out to say that mineral exploration and development is, is an essential service. And so that means we can continue operating. Um, all of uh, Many of our partners, our transportation and logistics partners are all continuing to operate. All of the assay labs where we're having our metallurgical work done have continued to operate. The assay labs that are, that are testing our... Uh, our um, drill samples have continued to operate. So <clears throat> we we chose to demobilize Springpole more because we were coming to the end of the winter. Um, we had an ice road in, so it was very helpful in logistics and getting you know fuel resupplied to the camp in hauling out samples. Um, but as that ice road was coming out, we always face a period of about six weeks in the in the spring and six weeks in the fall where we'll go down to care and maintenance at Springpole 
um, just because you have to helicopter support the camp and that gets expensive. So the ice is now off the lake. We can land float planes, which is far more cost effective. And uh, we've got a very robust um, COVID-19 policy that the teams worked on very well, you know, in conjunction with ministries of health and a lot of the guidance um, that a lot of remote camp operations have had. But what a lot of people forget is that um, remote camps always have um, sort of containment uh, containment protocols for infectious disease, right? Whenever you are further away from healthcare, I think you really do need to have um, mm -hmm. things like isolation protocols, whether it's for, you know, the foodborne illness or whether it's for, uh, you know, other infectious diseases. So in some senses, a lot of this is not that new to people operating in remote camps, you know, we're, but we've obviously, um, boosted our our uh, our health and safety protocols specifically with covid 19 and and we're excited to get people uh back out to work at the project for sure okay thanks for this answer uh second question then um just um yeah work out a little bit about the 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 reasons why um we, we should invest now in the company um regarding the undervaluation of the mm -hmm. of the share shares can you just maybe go back to the to the slide and tell us a little more about that why is sure. now a good time to invest why is now okay. a good time to invest well you know i think um no and just go back to to frame it here um yeah. you know i listen i think we're we're sitting today with um our company having faced a number of of uh concerns from our shareholders and I think some of our main concerns were, um, and we hear it all the time, uh, concern about dilution, right? And part of it is in the last eight years, no one has wanted to look at projects that have $800 million US capital, right? Big companies haven't wanted to look at them, not big low grade open pits. Um, these were, you know, there were a few projects of that description and different, but you know, and each for their own reasons had challenges. Um, but I think for for us now sitting in this gold environment um, where the developers have been really ignored since about 2012, I like to call it the capital strike, right? There has been very little money put into project development since, you know, since 2012 at the at the top of the last cycle. Um, and that's big companies have not been making strategic investments. Big companies have not been building new projects. Everyone has been focused on increasing free cash flow. <clears throat> so here's here's what is to come, and here's why I think the real opportunity is now, because the free cash flow to the gold industry, with the gold at seventeen hundred dollars, is triple what it was in early 2019. So with triple the free cash flow, big companies are starting to look at how they are going to extend their reserves. But they haven't invested in exploration and they haven't invested in development. And so, you know, there's a number of really interesting reports. S&P put out a great report a couple of weeks ago um, that showed really when major discoveries have been made. And we just, you know, we haven't had really major two million ounce plus discoveries made um, not very many anywhere in a place that you would want to build a mine uh, in the last five years because there just hasn't been the expenditure on exploration. Mm -hmm. So I think with all of that, this environment is coming to the point where these development projects are going to be valued very highly. And if you think back to the last time we were in a gold environment like this, so this is 2010, 2011, which is the last time the gold price was $1,700. We had a really robust business in my prior career as a corporate finance guy and an M&A guy um, helping finance and then selling single asset companies because okay, everyone you. was looking for projects. Yeah, so I, I think with, as a, yeah, with all yeah. of that, we're coming into an environment where we are going to have the projects that the industry needs at the time that they need them. 
Okay, thanks. Maybe uh, just a technical uh, question, Sue. You have 722 million shares outstanding, fully dilute, diluted. And the question is, is is there, are you considering a share rollback or something like that? Yeah, you know, we uh, we get asked that question all the time. I was going to say, uh, hit the tape. You just need to pre-record the answer for that one. Yeah, I know, exactly. No, it's, it's funny. Um, uh, we do get asked that question all the time, uh, and it's usually asked from one of two perspectives. One, we have shareholders who really think that we should roll back the shares. This is It is an impediment mm -hmm. to some people investing. Um, we have other shareholders who say, you know, how dare you ever consider rolling back the shares? And there seems to be no one in the middle. You know, that's the interesting thing about this this perspective on 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 rollbacks. Um, I, you know, I'm I'm pretty agnostic about it myself. I think the math's pretty easy to do, uh, but uh, I think we don't have any plans to do it right now. Um, <clears throat> you know, and I think if we were ever going to do it, it would need to be on the back of a real catalyst. Um, and something that was kind of transforming the company. Um, yeah, uh, but again, I, I think we hear it every day and we hear it from both sides every day. So at, at this point, no, no, uh, you know, no real plan to do it. Okay, thank you. So um, I will just um, explain in German too. So. Ähm, Dan hat gesagt, also er sieht vor allem jetzt die Underwaluation und Unterbewertung der Aktie. Das lief über Jahre ja gleichmäßig. Viele Aktien wurden sehr niedrig bewertet. Ähm, aktuell war jetzt 10 Dollar pro Unze, ähm, wenn man das mal runterrechnet auf die Ressource. Und jetzt ist das Goldumfeld ein anderes. Und zweitens, und das hatte, darauf hat Dan verwiesen, auch die SP-Studie von letzter Woche, ähm, die nochmal geschaut hat, wie viele neue Ressourcen wurden eigentlich entdeckt in guten Jurisdiktionen wie Kanada. Und wir reden jetzt nicht über ähm, schwierige Sachen, politische Sachen oder auch einfach, wo, wo das Umfeld viel schwieriger ist. In afrikanischen Staaten, teilweise Südamerika etc. Ähm, ähm, das hat, hat er alles nicht, weil alle Projekte in Kanada sind sicherer Rechtsstaat und ähm, die großen Majors gucken jetzt wieder danach nach den großen Projekten, weil denen die Reserven ähm, ausgehen. Ich, ich sag mal ein kurzes Beispiel, Nevada Gold Mines hat 40 Millionen Reserven, produziert aber 4 Millionen pro Unzen pro Jahr. Das heißt, in zehn Jahren haben die keins mehr. Von diesen, also man könnte noch viele Beispiele bringen, welche Majors ähm, da große Probleme haben. Zum Rollback, es wird, es gibt jetzt keine Pläne zum Rollback, er wird oft gefragt, es gibt Akt größere Aktionäre, die, die für einen Rollback sind, ähm, Stehen ja relativ viele Aktien aus, 722 Millionen, aber ähm, derzeit gibt es keine Pläne dafür. Ähm, die Großaktionäre haben übrigens das ein große, eine First Mining ist vor allem ein Retail, eine Retail-Firma. Die Aktionäre sind zu 88 Prozent Retail-Investoren. Ähm, das spielt ja vielleicht auch nochmal eine Rolle, müssen wir mal schauen. Genau. So, the next question, um, Dan, um, is regarding the tailings, I think. That was a question for the tailings. Um, yeah. Ah, yeah. What would be the pros and cons of going with a dry tailings operation at Goldland? <laughs> um, well, yeah, interesting. At uh, you know, we're we're not nearly that advanced at Goldland to be thinking of uh, of the the sort of type of tailings that we would have there. There is actually yeah. an old tailings pond at Goldland because they produced for 18 months in the 1980s. So there is an area of tailings yeah. already disturbed. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that's a really germane question to our pre-feasibility study at Springpool because we have been going through trade-off studies uh, in the last couple of months on uh, looking at conventional tailings versus dry tailings, dry stack tailings. And, um, you know, I think we are likely going to come down on the side of dry stack tailings uh, or tailings co-disposal. Um, in in large part because I think if you recall when I when I showed the the footprint of the project, um, it's important to understand right when you look at the footprint of Spring Pole and this I'll just give you and bring it back up so people can see it. Um, this for a project of this size, considering that that dewatered area becomes a lake again at the end of the mine at the end of the reclamation process. This is going to be one of the smallest net footprints of any open pit of its size anywhere in the world, just by definition of it starting, the, the pit itself starting as a lake and ending as a lake. But in the PEA, we'd scoped uh, conventional thickened tailings, and you can sort of see the size of it here. 
some of the trade-off work we've been doing on dry stack would mean that you could essentially shrink the size of this down you know to about that and so and potentially depending on on what we're doing you know with some changes in strip ratio you know potentially remove the second waste storage facility so we think we can get the footprint even smaller and given that we are in an area surrounded by water here given that the main concern continually expressed by our indigenous communities and rightfully so as they are, they live downstream of the lake, their main concern is we don't want you to make sure that you're not going to pollute the water. And so if you can conclusively say to people that, you know, we're never going to have tailings flowing into a lake because our tailings are going to be, you know, dry stacked and co-disposed, we think that there's some real value in the permittability of that. So we're still finishing off the trade-off studies, but that's that's certainly the pros. The traditional con on dry stack is capital and operating cost. But I think for us, given um, you know the size of the conventional tailings facility, the fact that it would need to be lined, um, as you know, as will any any dry stack facility, uh, we think that there is just some you know some real opportunity in that um, where we're going to offset a bunch of the capital cost of a much bigger facility. Um, so yeah, still doing trade-offs on the pros and cons, but certainly I think from a net benefit to the environment, um, it's it's leaning in that direction that I think it would be a good idea, assuming the project can afford it. Okay, thanks. So I have one last question from Germany. Um, you have many projects. You have Springpole, Goldland, and in Quebec the projects, and other projects in Ontario. So is there a risk that you you have too many projects? I think this is a very yeah, it's a question many people have. And my question is um, regarding this. Um, is there a strategy to say we will sell Spring Pole or we will sell Goatland or the whole company? Or what's your strategy on this aspects? Yeah, no, and listen, that's it's a very good point. And it comes down to focus. And uh, I think when we um, when we talk about the portfolio, I mean, even in this presentation, you will see we never really have any time to talk about the value of any of our other projects. I think part of the reason the valuation of our company is where it is, is because the value of Springpole sort of overshadows everything else because it's a big significant project. Um, so, you know, we, we think a lot about an overall strategy of the direction that it's going. Um, I, on the portfolio assets, you know, again, I think we've demonstrated with our Pickle Crow project and moving that forward with a partnership. I think there is a good model to be had for us to find partners for some of our other projects. We have not been in an environment where people could raise money to advance other projects um, until now. And now we are. And now we are getting a lot of phone calls on our other projects because the industry is desperate for projects and now we're not going to let them go cheaply. Um, uh, but I think in terms of our focus, I don't think we need to look really any further. And I keep bringing back our team, you know, to this slide. And when we talk about where we are going to surface the value in this company, we can spend a lot of time trying to get, you know, these from zero to 50, and that's big relative to our market cap, but the single biggest opportunity we have is to maximize the value of Springfall. And I've thought that from before I took the job as CEO, and I continue to think that that's, that's, that has to be the real focus. So for us, uh, on the balance of the portfolio assets, yeah, it's, it's, it's about doing, and it has been for the last year and a half, doing the sensible work so we can understand them so we can position them potentially with other partners who can then spend more sizable capital to get them ready so that they will be really attractive projects at the point in the cycle when they are most valuable. And you know, I think what we've done with Pickle Crow is a really good example of that. When you find the right partner, you know, we can turn something that, you know, sitting on our books, you know, in some sense is almost as a liability. <laughs> And we can turn that into, you know, what I think <coughs> ultimately is going to be somewhere, you know, 
between 30 and 40 million dollars of value and then take that value to go to the second part of your question of too many projects which is how are you going to keep everything funded right because it's expensive moving five million ounce projects through permitting processes the good news is we're most of the way there right so we had to get creative um, in our partnership with Asenko, which is working really well you know they come in as great partners uh, allowed us to you know they're taking shares for a big chunk of the work that they're doing and that allows us to advance the projects in times when cash was very tight um, but some in as we move the other projects forward here um, we are going to be able to turn some of those things into cash that is going to mean that we're not going to have you know uh, perpetual dilution to our shareholders to move the projects forward but even if we didn't ever monetize any of the other assets and that's the the strategy is that we are going to but even if we didn't the amount of money we need to get from here to 2023 with spring pool funded is not much more money than we have raised over the last year and we raised that from our shareholder base who've been there and great and supportive when we've asked them when we've needed them they have always showed up for us and that's in big part because we have a lot of real believers a lot of people who back keith newmeyer a lot of people who remember you know first majestic when it was set up and when you know it went for a you know a sort of for a lot of investors made them kind of generational amounts of wealth so and it's you know particularly with our with our audience in germany you know it's it's amazing to see the lineup at the booth at the Edelmetall Messe, uh, and you know the number of people who are taking selfies with Keith because you know First Majestic <laughs> bought their car or bought their house or whatever, right? It's there is there is that real goodwill. So you know, much as we aspire to migrate our shareholder base, get bigger institutional investors in, because this this company should be held by institutions. We're not really, but we will be um but you know we just we we do need to always remember and and so greatly value the investor base that we do have right now so yeah i think that's it's a okay. a bit of a circuitous way to say um we know where we need to add the value and we do need to focus okay thank you so i will just do it shortly in german um noch mal ganz kurz auf deutsch also er sieht nicht die Gefahr einer Verzettelung. Er kommt ja noch nicht mal dazu, in den Präsentationen auf andere Projekte außer Springpool einzugehen. Also Springpool steht absolut im Fokus und man wird es mit kleinem Geld, er hat ja gesagt, letztes Jahr haben sie 18 Millionen Dollar geraced, äh, mit kleinem Geld bis in die, in die Machbarkeitsstudie bringen, wo man am Ende weiß, bauen wir da eine Mine oder nicht. Und das sieht ja gut aus, wenn man nach allem, was wir bisher an Informationen haben. Ähm, und ähm, generell, äh, bisher war die Unterstützung vor allem auch durch Keith Neumann, der in den Präsidenten, der auch in Deutschland ja sehr bekannt ist, sehr gut unter den Aktionären, unter denen auch, ähm, ich sag mal, da steht zwar 88 Prozent Retail, aber da ist ja natürlich auch viele Vermögensverwalter etc. Ähm, insofern ist Stander optimistisch, dass man das auch finanzieren kann. Bei den anderen Projekten, dann wird es so sein wie Picket Crow und ähm, dass man sich Partner sucht. Man darf nicht vergessen, das sind alles Projekte, wo es ehemals Minen gab. Das heißt, eine gewisse Infrastruktur ist da eine relativ hohe Wahrscheinlichkeit im Vergleich zu natürlich so Greenfield-Projekten, dass da auch wirklich was ist. Und momentan kriegt er tägliche Anrufe, wie er die, die Projekte aus, ja, optionieren kann, so nennt sich das in der Branche, so dass ein anderer die Arbeit macht, aber man sich zum Beispiel ein Net Smelter Return oder ähnliches sichert, Anteile in den Firmen etc. Da gibt es immer verschiedene Deals von den, von den Firmen. Um, ich habe noch eine letzte Frage, so last question maybe for today. Um, then it's a, a question to the whole market. So um, the last years, you, you told us before, so 2017, 16, 18, people were in Canada, especially or North America, were looking after blockchain and cannabis. Um, <laughs> and this was risk capital. We, we, we couldn't find in the, in the gold sector or in the precious metal sector. So do you think this money is coming back or did the people just lo lost the money? Yeah. Um, what's your what's opinion or what do you hear on the streets in, in Canada? Yeah, listen, that, that capital is coming back. Uh, and I think we've started to see it, you know, interestingly in the, the e even late last year, some of that higher risk capital going into very early stage exploration. And it's been a bit bizarre that um, 
you know, exploration companies have been able to raise $5 million, you know, even through the fall last year with a reasonable prospect. Um, but those of us sitting with, you know, 11 million ounces of gold in a portfolio are real defined resources and projects. No one cared. Right. So that's a, yeah. that's a bit of a sense of the size of that risk capital. But there, there are a couple of a couple of more important sources of capital that are coming back to the sector. And for the first time really since 2012, we're starting to see um, broader based uh, participation in financings. We're starting to see um, institutional capital financing developers again. And literally it's, it's like from particularly 2015, um, almost every institution certainly the institutions in toronto they they had one or two names that they would that they would continue to invest in but by and large they have just not been even the dedicated resource funds have been investing in producers and maybe rightly so the producers have moved first but now they're <laughs> starting to look at valuation again and you have value investors starting to look back down the chain and they're starting to realize as they look at, you know, valuations of producers that are pricing in both gold price appreciation and production growth, but there's just no production growth to come. So hence, we're starting to see the M&A market coming around. Uh, I, I noticed yesterday, literally for the first time in, in since at least 2016, there was an article in the Globe and Mail in Toronto <clears throat> about here are the seven gold stocks you should own. And I've never been a real conspiracy theorist, but if you look at, at how gold is so not in the mainstream mindset yet, I this is this is a first article like this that has said, oh look, you know, here's seven gold stocks that are starting to move. And the seven gold stocks were like Agnico and Barrick and you know, like the big guys. It, the big guys it, 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 it's kind of a no-brainer and by the way they've already moved and they're trading at clickbait that's yeah. clickbait, yeah. <laughs> clickbait. Two, two times net asset value whereas you know at some point people start looking for value and that's you know we're, we're not alone in the in the developers that haven't moved <clears throat> there are a lot of us we're just particularly i think relative to some of the other developers um, partly due to the, you know, the complication of our portfolio, uh, the opportunity in our portfolio, I should say. Um, yeah, uh, I think there's a there's a lot of room for that to to continue to move. So the capital is coming back into the sector, which is another reason why I think now is a great time to get positioned because it's not going to take much when the rush comes, you know. And we've seen it in a couple of stocks yeah. already. Developers that are up two and three times in a couple of weeks. Okay, thank you, Dan. Um, vielen Dank den Zuhörern, sag ich schon mal und übergebe an Kai. So Kai, the last yeah, no, words are yours. <laughs> no, I get to open and close, so that's fantastic. Um, I really appreciate the time, Dan Sparrows. Thanks for, for uh, attending and uh, giving us this presentation. I think all the questions were answered. If there are any further questions, please feel free to email us. You have Tariq or my email, uh, email addresses. You should have them. Um, feel free to send us an email in German. No, no, no problem at all. We'll forward them to Spiros and Dan, and uh, we'll get them answered. Uh, also, just side note: we recorded this webinar, so we'll be uploading this to YouTube uh, as well. You can go to youtube.com/soarfinancial where you can find the webinar. And a quick reminder: we've been doing daily interviews with uh, company CEOs on Twitter live, uh, also uploading them to YouTube. Um, called SF Live. It's a daily format. We've got 39 episodes so far, and uh, today's a bit of a special one because I get to talk to uh, Phil Baker of Hecla. So that's going to be an interesting one. Um, in light of what the company's been doing financially lately, uh, it's going to be a really interesting conversation. And um, really appreciate everybody's time dialing in, and uh, please stay please stay safe. And uh, I hope we get to to do uh, proper meetings uh, very very soon. And uh, yeah, let's uh, yeah let's stay safe. Th thanks for dialing in. Bye.